Hello my dear students. So I am moving on to the next chapter where I am going to discuss vertebrates. So as we have discussed so far, we started off with discussing artificial and natural classifications. And you all know natural classification is more better because it considers more characteristics as well as it shows phylogenetic relationships between organisms. So from that, we came to understand the three domain classification which includes domain archaea, domain bacteria and domain eukarya. And under domain eukarya, you all know there are four kingdoms. What are they? Kingdom protista, kingdom fungi, kingdom plantae and kingdom animalia. So now under kingdom animalia, there are two main groups based on whether they possess a vertebral column or not. So we discussed the invertebrates in the previous chapter and now I'm going to discuss vertebrates. So if we take kingdom animalia, you all know the invertebrates, Nidaria or Salentarata, Annelida, Mollusca, Arthropoda and Echinodermata. Then we have the vertebrates. What are the vertebrates? Again we have pieces, that is the fishes. Then we have amphibia, amphibia, amphibians, reptilia, reptiles, aves, birds and mammalia, mammals. So we will be looking at each of these groups, the classes in more detail. Under vertebrates, we have pieces, amphibia, reptilia, aves and mammalia. So with that students, I will move on to the next slide. Vertebrates. So here if you look at this picture, you can see the vertebral column. So this is a vertebral column. Vertebral column. So the animals that belong to the group vertebrates, they have this vertebral column in their dorsal part of the body. When we say dorsal part, now we are people, man, when we stand the front part, that is the face, you have the face, this side is the ventral side and behind our back side is the dorsal side. If you take an animal that walks with four legs, the top part, Say if you take a dog, the upper part of the dog is the dorsal side and the stomach side, the below part is the ventral side. So here there is a vertebral column normally in the dorsal part of the body. So we will try to understand that. Vertebrates, an organism with a vertebral column is referred to as a vertebrate. So it should have a vertebral column that is important. If it doesn't have, it is an invertebrate. When it has, it is a vertebrate. An organism with a vertebral column is referred to as a vertebrate. And they can be classified into five groups. So here we say five groups considering their structural features. So what are the five groups we have already discussed? Pisces or Pisces. Then we had Amphibia. Reptilia. Aves. And Mammalia. So now we will have to discuss these one by one. So with that introduction students, I will move on to the next slide. Here you can see the longitudinal section of a chordate. Now I explain this chordate to you all. I told you all about a notochord. Notochord is again a tube-like structure, a flexible structure. If that is present in any stage of a life cycle of a certain organism, then we call them as chordates. Now, when I explain that, I told you all in man, that is us, in the fetal stage, that the embryonic development stages, we do have the notochord. But after that, the notochord is 
incorporated with our vertebral column. So we are vertebrates. Here of course you can see the longitudinal section of a chordate. So there you can see students this part is the spinal cord. What you see as yes, this is the shape of the body. So I told you all this is the dorsal side that is the top part. This part is the ventral side. So there are the blue color structure, rod like structure is the spinal cord. Spinal cord, what is a spinal cord? Now you know in our back we have the vertebral column and up here we have the skull. Inside the skull we have our brain and from the brain there is a nervous structure that is going through the vertebral column and that is what is known as spinal cord. So that is part of our nervous system. You will discuss nervous system in your next week. So spinal cord is part of the nervous system. So this light blue color structure, tube like structure that is the notochord. So that is notochord. Then here you have the tail part of the organism. So there we have the tail fin or tail we can say tail part of the organism. Then here we have the gills and this pink color structure is the ventral heart. So this side we write it as ventral heart. Ventral, I told you all, the below part of the organism is known as the ventral side, upper part is the dorsal side. So that's why we say ventral heart. So spinal cord, not a cord, the tail and the gills. These are the parts that you can identify from a longitudinal section of a cord. So from this of course you have to mainly understand the presence of not a cord and the spinal cord as I told you it will be present inside the vertebral column in most of the organisms. Those are the chordates. So with that understanding students I will move on to the next slide. Under this, we look at the first group under vertebrates, pieces. Pieces, these are the fishes. So fish that are well adapted to live in water belong to this group. So, so far we have been discussing organisms one by one. Here you can see fish are well adapted to live in water. They belong to this group. They live in fresh water and marine environment. So it can be any aquatic environment. There are freshwater fishes, there are marine fishes. They live in freshwater and marine environments. Some have cartilaginous skeleton. Say they all have endoskeleton, a skeleton inside and that skeleton can be made out of cartilages. So then we call it as cartilaginous skeletons. Then we call those types of fishes as cartilaginous fishes. Cartilaginous fish. Some have bony skeleton. Then of course they are known as bony fish. Fishes like shark, ray, skates. Those are cartilaginous fishes. Whereas bony fishes, normally tuna, seerfish, even seahorse, butterfly fish, those come under bony fishes. Most of the fishes are bony fishes. We will discuss them later in this lesson. First, we will look at the examples. So here you can see some of the fishes shown to you. Butterfly fish, because it has the shape of a butterfly. Then we have the skate. Skate, ray, shark, all of them are, as I told you, cartilaginous fishes. Then we have seahorse. So as examples, we can write butterfly fish, skate, then shark, ray, tuna, Seahorse, even tilapia, 
So like that you can think of many different fishes. Even the goldfish that we have in our households in fish tanks. That also is a type of fish. So there are many different types of fishes. What are the common features you all can identify here? Now seahorse of course is somewhat different because it looks like a horse but it does have the feature of fishes. So before we try to understand the different shapes or the features of fishes, so first we will watch a video to observe some of these fishes in their natural habitat. Okay students, so were you all able to observe the fishes in their natural habitats? Yes, so you would have been able to see how they swim in water and therefore the adaptations they have in order to live in water. So what is the first adaptation? You are familiar with that. They have streamlined body shape. What is streamlined body shape? Streamlined body shape is like this. The middle part of the body is more cylindrical or broader whereas the two ends are tapering ends. So that makes it easy for the fish to swim through water. Then you know they have these fins. The tail fin is there, then there is the dorsal fin, there is the ventral fin. Those are things that you would have observed. Then you would have seen the gills. Gills in some fishes it's visible, some are covered. So gills are there for respiration. Then you would have seen the eyes. Do the eyes have eyelids? No, they don't have eyelids. Then what else did you notice? You would have noticed the scales in fishes. So those are all different properties. So they have a streamlined body. Streamlined body. They have fins, then they have scales, they have gills, then eyes without lids. These are some common features. If you compare this with these examples, now this is a butterfly fish. You can somehow related to the streamlined body. Then you can see the fins there. Then there are obviously scales. You can see the eye without eyelids. Then there is the gills also that is used for respiration. Again here. Now this is a skate. The shape is somewhat different because it's more like a flat broad shape. But if you look at the body part here, that will have a streamlined body so that it can swim through easily. And here the fin is more like a tail like structure and all the rest of the features will be there. Then in both of them there is the endoskeleton. This has a bony endoskeleton, this will have a cartilaginous endoskeleton. Then again seahorse. Even that has a body shape that is similar to streamlined body. But it swims in a different way. 
So this has more adaptations or we can say they deviate from the body of a normal fish but still they are fishes. So that's how you are supposed to relate them. Most of the fishes as you look at them you can identify but some of them like seahorses it does not really fit the normal description of a fish but it belongs to pieces. That is a vertebrate group, the first group of vertebrates, pieces. The same way, if you think of dolphins, whales, they do resemble fishes. They are body shape and all that. They live in the aquatic environment. But you all know they are not fishes. They are mammals. So when it comes to this group, you have to be careful. Some of them don't exactly fit the description, but they are fishes. Some of them that look like fishes are not fishes, they are mammals. So you have to look at all the features carefully. So I'm sure students, you all have a good idea about these characteristics. That is pieces, fish that are well adapted to live in water. They live in fresh water and marine water. Then there are cartilaginous fishes and bony fishes. And we looked at some examples as well. So with that introduction, I will move on to the next slide where we discuss some more features. Features of fish. So when we say features of fish, they possess a bony or cartilage endoskeleton. So based on this, there are two main types of fishes, bony fishes and cartilaginous fishes. And it is an endoskeleton. That means it's there inside the body, not outside, endoskeleton. Then the body is streamlined shape. That also I explained to you. Streamlined shape body to swim in water. Then there is scales. Body is covered by scales. What is the function of scales? It is there for protection as well as locomotion. Scales for protection, protection and locomotion. So streamlined body also helps in swimming and the scales also help in protection as well as locomotion. Then they possess fins for swimming and balancing. As I showed you all for swimming and balancing the fins. There is the tail fin. Then there is the dorsal fin, ventral fin. All these fins help to navigate through water, balance their body while swimming and also to turn. So that is basically navigation. So possess fins for swimming and balancing purposes. Then the next one possesses a lateral line to detect vibrations in water. A lateral line. This lateral line is like a sensory organ. It can actually sense the pressure of water. It can sense vibrations in water. So that again is used for movement, locomotion. When they are swimming in water, they know what is happening around them. They can understand their environment. So this is a sensory organ, lateral line. In some of the fishes, people who eat fish, who you all might have seen fishes, then you may have identified this line. Around, around the body of the fish, you can see the lateral line. Like a faint line, it is visible. If we go to the next feature, the fishes have a two-chambered heart. Now this is something students you all have to understand through the evolutionary process how the heart develops. Now the fish has a two chambered heart and normally in our heart there are two types of chambers atrium and ventricle. So here they have a single atrium and a ventricle. One atrium, one ventricle. So two chambered heart. Then respiration by gills. Respire by gills. I am stu sure students you know almost all of these characteristics because you have learned this in the smaller grades also. And gills you would have seen that. In some of the fishes, especially the bony fishes, there is a, 
flap-like structure that is called the operculum and when you open that operculum you can see that red color gills. So you know what that is. It's like a oval shape like a lace like structure with like stripes that is the way you just see the gills that is used for respiration. Then if we look at the body temperature of fishes these are cold blooded animals. Cold blooded animals means the body temperature changes according to the envi environment temperature. The body temperature changes according to the environment temperature. They are also known as poikilothermic organisms. So another name is poikilothermic thermic animals. So cold blooded animals that is body temperature changes according to the environmental temperature. They are known as poikilothermic animals and they have eyes without eyelids. Eyes without eyelids. Why do you think that is? Inside water it will be really difficult for the fish to close and open the eye. It's easier to have eyes without eyelids. So fishes have eyes without eyelids. Those are the features. Features of fish possess a bony or a cartilage endoskeleton. Body is streamlined shape to swim in water. Body is covered by scales. Possess fins for swimming and balancing. Possess a lateral line to detect vibrations in water. Two chambered heart that has a single atrium and a ventricle. Respiration is done by gills. Cold blooded animals that is body temperature changes according to the environmental temperature. We call them poikilothermic animals and eyes are without eyelids. Those are the features that you need to understand. With that students I will move on to the next slide. So here we have an extra knowledge slide. This is the eye in your textbook. For extra knowledge, the fish live on earth can be divided into two classes considering the endoskeleton. So when I mentioned this, I told you all there are the cartilaginous fishes and the bony fishes. So they come under two groups or two classes. Here you can see they come under two classes. So the first class is class chondrichthyes. The fish with skeleton made up of cartilages. So cartilaginous fish belong to this class. Ostichthyes, the fish with skeleton made up of bones belong to this class. Ostichthyes is the group where the bony fishes belong to. Chondrichthyes is the group where cartilaginous fishes belong to. Now if we look at the two types of fishes, here you can see Examples are shark and skate. When I explained also, I told you all shark, skate, race, those type of fishes belong to cartilaginous fishes or chondrichthyes. You can see the shape. That is the streamlined body shape. They do have the fins. They have the all the features of a fish. But only thing is their endoskeleton is made up of cartilage. And because of that, they have certain different features from the bony fishes, that is ostichthyes. Sea fish, tilapia, seahorse, all of those belong to bony fishes. Here also you can identify the streamlined body shape, you can see the fins, you can see the operculum here, this is the operculum that I told you all, then the gills are inside that. And also you can see the eyes without eyelids. Here also you can see the eyes without eyelids. So basically they have the same structure but they do have slight differences. Now we will look at those differences. Chondrichthys endoskeleton is made up of cartilage whereas ostichthys endoskeleton is made up of bones. That's the main difference. One is cartilage, the other one is bones. If you take the cartilaginous fishes, they only live in sea. They live only in sea. 
but the bony fishes live in both sea and fresh water. So you all know there are marine fishes and freshwater fishes. So those are all bony fishes. About 10% of fish belong to this group. Only 10% of the fish belong to cartilaginous fish. Whereas 90% of the fish are bony fishes. So they have bony endoskeleton. Then if you look at the gills, gill slits are not covered by an operculum. So here there is no, in this picture of course you cannot see that clearly, but normally when you take a shark or a skate, you can see their gills are not or gill slits are not covered by an operculum. Operculum is the cover. Here you can see the operculum. This part is the operculum. So here bony fishes. Gills are covered by a pair of operculum. So gills are not visible to outside. Operculum is this particular structure. That is the operculum. So that covers the gills. Then if you look at the position of the mouth. Anterior ventral mouth. Anterior means towards the front end and ventral. So you can see the body of the fish. It is towards the front end but they are also ventral. I told you all the upper side is the dorsal side. The bottom side or below this side is the ventral side. Anterior towards the front but ventral towards the below of the body. So anterior ventral mouth in cartilaginous fishes. Whereas if you take the bony fishes, you can see terminal mouth at the end, termin. So the mouth is at the terminal end of the body, terminal mouth. The next one is about the fin, heterocircle caudal fin. When you say heterocircle, look at this fin. The shape of the fin, the tail fin is something like that. It is not symmetric. This side you can see is more elongated. But this side it's like a small lobe like structure. So that is what we mean by heterocircle caudal fin. Whereas here you can see the bony fissures homocircle caudal fin. Look at the fin there. It's symmetric like that. It's symmetric. So this is heterocircle, this is homocircle. So heterocircle caudal fin in cartilaginous fishes, whereas homocircle caudal fin in bony fishes. And examples for chondrichthys, shark and skate. For osteichthys, there is seerfish, tilapia and seahorses. So those are some information related to cartilaginous fishes and bony fishes. The two groups based on their nature of endoskeleton. That is very important. Nature of the endoskeleton. So is that clear to you all students? When you look at a fish, you can observe the gills. You can observe the caudal fins. And you can observe the position of the mouth. From that, you can identify whether the endoskeleton is made up of cartilage or bones. So you can group them as chondrichthys and osteichthys. So with that information students, I will move on to the next slide. So here we look at the second group that is amphibians. From the name amphi, you know there are two. Amphibians need two mediums to complete their life cycle. So if they live on land, that is the terrestrial environment, to complete their life cycle, they need to go to water. Or water is a must to complete their life cycle. So those are the organisms. They use two media or two habitats, amphibians. Amphibians which need water to complete their life cycle belong to this class. They need water to complete their life cycle. That is an important feature. And they are the first organisms to invade land during evolution. So you can imagine the evolutionary process. Now initially it is the fishes. They live completely inside water. 
and little by little they start moving towards the seashore and from there they migrate to the terrestrial environment and during that migration process they evolve into amphibians. So that could be another reason why amphibians need to have water to complete their life cycle. So they are the first organisms to invade land during evolution. Examples. Here you can see toad, frog. Toad and frog, they look almost the same. But you all know the color, the shape, all those are slightly different. And they are habitat. Now toads mainly live on land. Whereas frogs mostly live in water. So that is why the different color because this is the terrestrial environment they are more brownish in color to camouflage with the soil. Whereas these frogs they mostly live on trees as well as moist environment. So you can see the yellowish color or greenish color body. So again for camouflage. Then we have the salamander. Salamander is also an amphibian. In addition to salamander, there is ichthyophis that is also an amphibian. So as examples, we can take toad, frog, salamander and ichthyophis. So ichthyophis is a scientific name. So, because we write it, we have to underline it. If it was printed, it would have been italicized. But since I am writing it, I have to underline it. So, toad, frog, salamander and ichthyophis. So, you all know students, these are the examples of amphibians. So, let us watch a video to understand and observe these amphibians in their natural habitat. Okay students, so now you all were able to observe them naturally. So you got a better understanding about these animals. You already know about them, but you were able to get a better understanding. With that understanding, I will move on to the next slide. So here I have the features of amphibians. Water is essential to complete the life cycle. So an aquatic stage is present in the life cycle. They must have an aquatic stage. So water is essential. So when you say life cycle, you have a mature organism. It does the, starts the reproductive process. From there, the next stage of the new offspring is produced and that develops into the mature organism. So that full cycle is the life cycle of an organism. And that can occur two main ways we can say, where there is a distinct change between the stages of the life cycle. And in the other one, there are no distinct changes between the stages of the organism. Now for example, if we take us, you have seen babies. Although babies are smaller in size, they can't walk, they can't talk. But still, by looking at a baby, you can say, okay, this is a, this is, baby is going to grow up to be a person. Because babies, although they are small, they resemble us, grown-up persons. The same way, if you take a puppy, the puppy looks very much similar to the mother dog or the father dog. Although the size and certain features are slightly different, they do have slight differences. You know what is a puppy, you know what is a dog. But still, they both look alike. So you know they are of the same species. But if you take the frog and a tadpole, 
tadpole is the larval stage of a frog. Can you say they are the same organisms? No. They are very much different or we can say they are distinctly different. So there is a change from the tadpole of starting from the eggs then to the tadpole from there to the frog there are different distinct changes taking place and that process is known as metamorphosis. The life cycle of these amphibians possess metamorphosis. So if we try to understand that better if you have a frog from the frog we get the eggs so those are dif a different stage and it's distinctly different from the mature frog then from that you get the tadpole stage so tadpole is very much different from the mature frog so this is a tadpole and that is the larval stage. Now here you can see the frog what you saw, saw in the picture. Egg and the tadpole. They are all different. So this change that takes place during their life cycle is what we call as metamorphosis. So then. If we look at the next feature. They possess a thin mucus skin thin mucus skin why is that you all know frogs respire through their skin so for respiration to take take place there should be gas exchange for gas exchange to happen the skin must be thin and it must be moist so that is why there is mucus thin mucus skin with glands that is also important so many features are included here the skin is thin it's mucus and it has glands so it's always moist there are no scales on skin no scales on skin so skin without scales but it is a thin skin it has glands and because of that it is moistened with mucus then if we look at the next one, they have pentadactyl limbs. Penta means five. Pentadactyls, like we have five fingers, they have five dactyls. So that is what we call as a pentadactyl limbs. Limbs, the four legs, hind limbs, four limbs. The limbs in front are known as four limbs. The limbs at the back are known as hind limbs. And you all know that the frogs and toads, they have webbed feet between their dactyls. There is like a membrane structure so that they can hop from one place to the other when they are on land and also they can use their limbs for swimming. So webbed feet is something that we use to refer those limbs. Pentadactyl limbs are used for locomotion. So five dactyls. Then they possess a three-chambered heart. Now you can remember. Fishes had two-chambered heart. Fishes had two-chambered heart. Amphibians have three-chambered heart. Development. So there they have two atria and a single ventricle. Two atria, the top chambers. Two atrium or two atria because there are two and one ventricle. So the evolution. Then if we look at respiration, it is done by three different organs. One is lungs, then the second one is moist skin and the third one buccal cavity. So like how we have lungs, the frogs also have lungs. But the lungs are of different shape and size. So they can respire through lungs. Then the thin moist skin with lot of glands which are moistened with mucus. And the buccal cavity. So if you look at this part of the frog, you can see that buccal cavity. And sometimes you hear them making that noise also. So they use that buccal cavity for respiration. So three different organs that are used for respiration. Lungs, moist skin and buccal cavity. Then if we look at the organisms, they are 
cold blooded animals you know the meaning now the body temperature changes with the environment environment temperature those are poikilothermic animals those are the features of amphibians we will this look at them again water is essential to complete their life cycle so that means an aquatic stage is present in the life cycle they possess metamorphosis changes possess a thin mucous skin with glands no scales on skin when the limbs are pentadactyle and this used for locomotion they possess three chambered heart two atria and one ventricle and respiration is done by lungs moist skin and buccal cavity and also they are cold blooded animals poikilothermic animals so i am sure you all can remember all these features and you can relate them to the particular animals so with that student i will move on to the next slide so next group reptilia animals that are well adapted to live on land belong to this group so they are well adapted to live on land so from in evolution students you all can remember fishes fishes they were well adapted to live in water then amphibians were the first group of organism to move from water to land migrate from water to land and now here you can see reptiles they are well adapted to live on land so animals that are well adapted to live on land belong to this group they live in terrestrial fresh water and marine ecosystem so although they are adapted to live on land they can live in the terrestrial environment fresh water and marine environment and some of them you all know for example crocodiles they move from land to water so during their lifetime even within the day they use both the environments so they are adapted to live on land but they use all different ecosystem as examples you can see here tortoise crocodile cobra all these organisms or all these animals are very different from each other if you just look at their shape they are different but they do have a lot of common features that is why they come under the group reptilia so as examples we can write tortoise even turtle belongs to this group then we have crocodile monitor we can take iguana different types of snakes cobra rattlesnake python all those come under reptiles so these are a few examples even lizard lizard so tortoise turtle crocodile monitor iguana snakes lizard all of them even cobra all the different types of snakes all of them are reptiles so now you know some examples for reptiles we will watch a video where you can observe these reptiles in their own habitat okay students after watching the video you would have got a better understanding about the habitat and the nature or the features of reptiles with that understanding we will move on to the next slide reptiles possess below features the first one dry skin without glands very important they have dry skin without glands now in the previous group you saw the gland was moist but here dry skin without glands and also they possess scales on skin so you can remember the skin of crocodiles skin of snakes 
they do have scales their skin is very dry and also somewhat rough it depends now crocodile skin is very thick and rough so they have dry skin without glands they possess scales on skin then the second one presence of pentadactyl limbs for locomotion what is pentadactyl limbs i told you all there are five dactyls like fingers the dactyls these are the dactyls so in each of their limbs they have four limbs four limbs number four in that the front limbs are four limbs and the back limbs are hind limbs in all those limbs they have pentadactyl limbs so five dactyls and that is used for locomotion but you can remember most of the organisms the lizards and the crocodile all those the reptiles mostly have short limbs comparatively short limbs but we don't go into detail we just remember as presence of pentadactyl limbs for locomotion then there is a heart with two atria and incompletely divided ventricle two atria and incompletely divided ventricle very important now again you can remember the evolution pisces had two chambered heart amphibians had three chambered heart with two atria and one ventricle now the reptiles have two atria and one ventricle that is incompletely divided so from there they are moving on to the four chambered heart so the development along evolution then respiration is done by lungs so only one respiratory organ lungs these are also cold blooded animals so poikilothermic animals the body temperature changes according to the environment temperature the last one they possess internal fertilization very important so the first group the under vertebrates that possess internal fertilization so fertilization takes place within the body of the organism so those are the features of reptiles dry skin without glands possess scales on skin presence of pentadactyl limbs for locomotion then heart with two atria and incompletely divided ventricle respiration is done by lungs cold blooded animals that is poikilothermic and they possess internal fertilization so these are the features of reptiles that you need to remember students so with that i will move on to the next group of organisms so the next group aves aves means birds so birds that have adapted for flying belong to this group so you have to remember they are birds they are adapted for flying so when we say they are adapted for flying he also they have the streamlined body shape so that they can easily fly through the air fly through air cut across through air then they have their wings for flight they have feathers then they have a beak depending on the food they eat food they consume the shape of the beak changes so those are all different features that can help you to identify the birds so streamlined body actually it is the four limbs two of the legs or limbs that have become the wings so they have two limbs the two legs and the two wings they have feathers on their body they have the beak so all these help to identify birds and birds vary in size shape and color and also the nature of their beak under that if we look at the largest bird that is shown to you here ostrich ostrich is the largest bird ostrich and the smallest bird is the hummingbird so starting from the largest bird ostrich this can't actually fly because it's too heavy for flight up to the smallest bird a very tiny bird hummingbird it can flap its wings very fast so that is the smallest bird all of them belong to the group aves 
So here you can see some of the birds. Jungle fowl, the national bird of Sri Lanka. Then we have ostrich, the largest bird. And we have penguins. Now penguins live in polar regions, in, in ice actually. But they also can't fly. But they belong to aves because of their feature. You can see their structure, the body shape, the feet, everything. They belong to group aves. And also they lay eggs. That is another feature of all these birds. They lay eggs. If I write examples, you can see the jungle fowl. I have already written ostrich, so penguin. Then we have parrot, crow, owl, kiwi. You can even consider emu. So all these are different types of birds. How about bats? Bats resemble birds. They do fly around, but they are not birds. Why? Because they are mammals. So again here, like the fishes. Here also there are some organisms, some animals that look like birds, but not. So bat is a mammal. Whereas if you look at this penguin and even ostrich, because they don't fly even kiwi, emu, they don't fly because they are too large. But they still belong to the group aves. So although we say birds that have adapted for flying belong to this class, there are birds that don't fly. But still they show all the characteristics or almost all the characteristics of aves. That is why we put them in this group. So with that understanding students, now that we have looked at some examples, we will watch a video to understand the birds in their natural habitat. Okay students, so that now you saw the birds in their natural habitats, you have seen them, you see them in your day to day life, but still now you are able to relate them to the features. So with that understanding, we will go to the next slide where we discuss the features of aves. Below are the features of birds. They possess a light bony endoskeleton. 
So endoskeleton, you all know the skeleton that is inside the body. That is again to provide the structure and all that. And it is made up of bone, so bony endoskeleton. And it has to be light. Why is that? Because the birds are well adapted for flight. So when they fly, they need to have the lowest body weight. So to, in order to decrease the body weight, the bony skeleton is light. Normally there are air sacs between the bony skeleton. In the bones there are air pores. So that it becomes light. Then they possess a streamlined body for flight. Streamlined body to easily cut through the air. So bony skeleton that is light and a streamlined body both are adaptations for flight. Then if you look at the skin, skin is covered, covered by feathers. So that is again a special feature of birds. The skin is covered by feathers. And from the feather, now feathers are different for, from bird to bird. If you look at a parrot, if you see the feather of a parrot, you know what bird that is. If you look at the feather of a peacock, then you can identify that as a peacock feather. Like that, by just looking at the feather itself, you can identify the birds, especially when the birds are familiar to you. Then there are scales, but these scales are restricted only to legs. Now in birds also students, there are four the number four, four limbs. Out of those, the front limbs are known as four limbs and the behind limbs are known as hind limbs. The four limbs are the limbs that have become the wings. Whereas the hind limbs, those are the legs. And on those legs only, there are scales. Then if you look at the face, they have no teeth, but they have a beak that is adapted to different modes of nutrition. Now when you think of different modes of nutrition, you can think of the duck. Duck eats fish, catches fish. So normally the duck has a flat broad beak. Whereas if you take the parrot, it has a curved very short beak because it feeds on nuts, fruits and things like that. If you take the crow, it has a very sharp somewhat long beak because it eats basically any substance. Then if you take a kingfisher, look at the kingfisher. It has a beak adapted to catch fish. Eagle has a different type of beak. Any bird that drinks nectar from the flowers, they have very thin long beaks. So all these beak shapes are based on their mode of nutrition. Then the next point. They have eyes with eyelids. So the birds have eyes with eyelids and they have very sharp sight. Because when they fly high above the land, they need to look at their surrounding. They need to see whether their prey is on the ground and they need to be aware of the predators. So for all those, they have very sharp sight. Then the next one, presence of pentadactyl limbs. We have been discussing pentadactyl limbs. Penta means five dactyls like fingers. So limbs with five dactyls that is the pentadactyl limbs for locomotion. And in that you need to remember students I told you all four limbs are converted into wings. And I told you all hind limbs are present as legs. So four limbs, hind limbs. Hind limbs are the legs and the four limbs are the wings. Then there are four chambers in the heart. Four chambered heart with two atria and two ventricles. So again I'll remind you all the evolution. Fishes they had two chambered heart, one atria, one ventricle. Then it was the amphibians. Amphibians had three chambered heart two atria and one ventricle. Whereas the reptiles, they had two atria and one ventricle that was partially divided. And here you can see in birds, aves, there are four chambers in the heart. Four chambered heart with two atria and two ventricles. Then if you look at the body temperature, 
they are warm blooded animals so they are known as homeothermic animals homeothermic can be spelled this way or homeothermic homeothermic animals both are correct refer to the same concept when we say warm blooded their body temperature does not change based on the environment temperature it remains the same warm blooded animals homeothermic or homeothermic then we have it here body temperature is not changed according to environmental temperature that is the meaning of warm blooded animal so warm blooded means body temperature is not changed according to environment temperature these are the features of birds they have a light bony endoskeleton they have a streamlined body for flying skin is covered with feathers scales are present only in legs then there is no teeth the beak is adapted to different modes of nutrition eyes with eyelids they have a sharp sight then they have pentadactyl limbs for locomotion and out of those hind limbs are the legs and the fore limbs are converted to wings four chambered heart with two atria and two ventricle they are warm blooded animals or homeothermic animals or homeothermic animals that means the body temperature does not change with the environment temperature so those are the features of birds or aves i'm sure you all can relate them to all the birds that you have seen in your environment with that students i will move on to the next group that is mammalia mammalia animals that nourish young with milk belong to class mammalia so they provide milk to their young or they nourish their young with milk so because of that the female organisms or female animals possess mammaric glands so animals that nourish young with milk belong to class mammalia here they have shown a very few examples of mammalia you can see rilava or mandi carrying its baby the young so that also will be nourished with milk then you can see bat again although it has wings it can fly it is a mammal and then dolphin whales i have told you all about this although they live in the sea they live like fishes they look similar to fishes but they are mammals so these are a few examples we know a lot of examples you all i am sure know a lot of mammals what are they we are mammals so as examples we can write man even gorilla is a mammal then there is bat dolphin bat dolphin then there is whale even sea lion then cow goat deer and you can even think of cat dog like this we can keep on including the mammals so rilava mandi bat dolphin man gorilla whale sea lion cow goat deer cat dog like that you can add the number of mammals all the all the mammals that you already know so these are all animals that nourish young with milk and they belong to class mammalia now that you have an idea about the mammals let's watch a video to understand more about them features of mammals skin is covered by hairs 
So this is a special feature of mammals. Now even if we take our body, our body the skin is covered with hair. On our head you can see the hair grows longer but normally on all parts of our body throughout uh, on the skin there is skin hair. So this is a special feature skin covered by hairs and the hairs are present inside hair follicles. Now if you take the skin if that is the skin there are follicles like that through this the hair grows up. So this is the hair follicle. Hair follicle and that is the hair. So inside within that the hair is alive the root of the hair but outside it's dead. That is why even if you break the hair from outside or you take a hair cut, you don't feel it. But if you pull the hair out, it has to come out of this follicle, then it hurts. That's because inside the hair follicle, the root of the hair that is alive. Then they possess mammary glands. Because they nourish their young with milk, the female animals, females have mammary glands but all the mammals they have sweat glands and sebaceous glands. The sebaceous gland produces sebum. So three types of glands. Mammary glands to produce milk and feed the young with milk, nourish the young with milk. That is only for a period of time the mammary gland will be active. But the sweat glands and sebaceous glands they are present in both males and females and they function always. So sweat glands to produce sweat. You will learn later about homeostasis. Balancing the body temperature. So these sweat glands are needed for that. You all know that by experience students. On a very warm day you tend to sweat a lot because the body wants to balance the temperature, decrease the body temperature. It produces a lot of sweat and when the sweat evaporates, our body temperature becomes normal. So you know we are warm-blooded animals like the birds. Birds and mammals are warm-blooded animals. You are familiar with that. So there is the sweat glands on skin. So the third type, the sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands produce sebum that again keeps the skin somewhat oily. You can't have completely dry skin. At the same time, you shouldn't have too oily skin also. But you all know for people, the skin type varies. It can be oily, normal or dry. But in order to keep the skin at a normal level, there should be a certain amount of sebum produced that is produced by the sebaceous clay. Then if we look at the next one, possess earlobes. Earlobes which are known as pinna. Now we have the earlobe here. This is an external earlobe. It's part of the external ear. That is a special feature of mammals. And by looking at the earlobe, you will be able to identify the mammal also. You know the earlobe of dogs are different, cows are different, monkeys it's different, horses. So like that, you can even relate the earlobe to the particular species. But earlobes, external earlobes which are known as pinnae are specific features of mammals. Then they have the four chambered heart with two atria on top and the two ventricles below. You are familiar with that as well. This is again similar to birds. Birds also have four chambered heart, two atria, two ventricles. Then this is a special feature, complete double circulation. What is the meaning of double circulation? Now when we take the heart, you all know the four chambers of the heart. The deoxygenated blood comes into the right atrium. From there, the blood flows into the right ventricle. Then from there, it goes through the pulmonary artery to the lungs. After it gets oxygenated, carbon dioxide is removed, oxygen is added to the blood, it comes back to the left atrium. This is left atrium, right atrium, right ventricle and left ventricle. So from here it goes into the left ventricle, then it is circulated throughout the body. 
again from the body, blood is collected and brought back into the right atrium. So there are two circulations. One circulation going from the right ventricle to the lungs coming back to the left atrium that is known as the pulmonary circulation. You are familiar with these students and then going from the left ventricle throughout the body coming back to the right atrium that is known as the systemic circulation. We will be discussing this in more detail in your next grade but for now you all can remember during the circulation there are two complete circulations taking place. That is what we call as complete double circulation. And in blood you all can remember the shape of red blood cells red blood cells RBC. Now this is a disc like shape but if you look at it from the side base it's going to be like this a biconcave disc. So that is RBC. RBC biconcave disc shape and that does not have a nucleus. The reason is if there is no nucleus, there is more space to accommodate oxygen because RBC red blood cell is the cell that transports oxygen through blood. So biconcave red blood cells lacking a nucleus that is another feature biconcave red blood cells lacking a nucleus. Then we have this one warm blooded animals that I told you all before also even birds always are warm blooded animals. Warm blooded animals are also known as homeothermic or homeothermic another name homeothermic. You can also write it like this homeothermic. Homeothermic. Both are correct. Homeothermic or homeothermic that means their body temperature does not change with the environment temperature. It remains the same. Normally we have a temperature, a normal temperature of a healthy adult should be 37 degrees Celsius. It can vary slightly between 36 and 37.5. Above that is also not good, below that is also not good. So it has to be a certain value between a very small range. That is the meaning of warm blooded animals or homeothermic animals. So you all can remember students two properties which are same as birds. One having four chambered heart, the other one being warm blooded animals. Two similarities between aves and mammals. Then the next one test is present outside the body. We will discuss this in the next lesson. Inside the testis only the sperms are produced. Now these sperms cannot survive inside the body because of the body temperature. That temperature is too much for them. So because of that they are stored externally outside the body and that is why the testis is present outside the body. Then we have the next one internal fertilization. Inside the body of the female only the egg and sperm combine and the fertilization takes place. So that process is internal fertilization. Then we have the last one. They possess a placenta and embryonic membranes. They have a placenta and embryonic membrane. Now this also we will discuss in the next chapter in more detail. Inside the mother's womb, the baby grows inside an embryonic sac. This is called an embryonic sac embryonic sac. This is made up of embryonic membranes. Made of embryonic membrane. So when we say this is what we call as the water bag. In normal terms we call it the water bag. So inside that the fetus will be here. Uh, students I am not very good at drawing. This is a fetus. So in that the fetus will be connected with the mother's uterine wall by the umbilical cord. Umbilical cord. And this umbilical cord attaches to the mother's uterine wall by the placenta. This is the 
placenta. So here this is the embryonic sac that is made up of embryonic membranes and inside the fetus grows. This is the fetus and when the fetus is there inside it's attached to the mother's womb by the umbilical cord and the point where the umbilical cord connects to the mother's uterine wall that is where what we call as placenta. So possessor placenta and embryonic membranes those are also special features of mammals. So I will go back and go through the features again. Features of mammals Skin is covered by hairs, hair, hair present inside hair follicles. Possess mammary glands, sweat glands and sebaceous glands to produce sebum. Three types of glands. Possess ear lobes or external ear lobes which are known as pinnae. Four chambered heart with two atria and two ventricles. Complete double circulation. Then biconcave red blood cells without a nucleus. They are warm blooded animals or homeothermic animals. Test is present outside the body. Internal fertilization takes place and they possess a placenta and embryonic membrane. So these are the features of mammals. So, so far student, we have been discussing all the different groups of organisms that come under three domain classification. So we started off with the three domain classification, domain archaea, includes methanogens and halophiles. Then domain bacteria that includes bacteria and cyanobacteria. Thereafter we looked at domain eukarya. Under domain eukarya there are four kingdoms. Kingdom protista which includes protozoans and algae. Then kingdom fungi includes all the fungi. Then kingdom plantae, all the different types of plants, we classified the plants also into other groups. Flowering plants, non-flowering plants, under non-flowering plants, we had the non-flowering seedless plants and non-flowering seed plants. Then under flowering plants, we looked at monocots and dicots. Then we started the kingdom animalia. Under kingdom animalia, two main groups, invertebrates and vertebrates. Under invertebrates, we discussed Nidaria or Salantrata, then Annelida, Mollusca, Arthropoda and Echinodermata. Then afterwards, we started the classes that come under vertebrates. So under that, we discussed Pisces or Pisces, then Amphibia, Reptilia, Aves and Mammals. So from all these discussions and all the videos that you watch, you all would have a very good understanding about all the organisms and how they are classified and you would have understood the natural relationship between organisms that belong to the speci specific species and the evolutionary relationship among different groups of organisms. So with that understanding students, I am sure when you see an organism in your environment, you will be able to identify it as a mammal or an amphibian or an arthropod by looking at its features. That is not enough. All these organisms have been systematically classified. But if you go to different countries, or even for that matter, you go to one country in that different places. If it's a country where more than one languages are used, for a certain type of organism, we use different names. For example, if you take mango, we call it mango tree in English. We call it amber in Sinhala and manga in Tamil. So like that, there are so many different names. So like that, if you go around the world, there are so many different names that point to the same organism. That is confusing for the scientists and us as well. So to avoid that confusion, scientists came up with a systematic method of naming organisms. So that is what we will be discussing after this. Nomenclature of organism. So nomenclature means naming organisms in a systematic manner.
So nomenclature of organism in each language an object is named using words. So I explained that to you all. Different names are used to identify organisms like the mango tree or even a dog, cat, anything. But these names vary according to the language, country and region. The evolutionary relationships are not depicted in those names. For example, if you take the man, the man who evolved first, then we evolved into a better uh, man and now homo sapiens, we are wise man because we can think. But when we say man, we just refer to everyone. We don't look at any evolutionary relationship. When we were discussing different organisms, I told you all, Echinodermata, phylum Echinodermata is phylogenetically related to chordata. So Echinodermates are related to chordates. So that relationship is not expressed when you use common names of different countries, languages that is not included. So to include that and to give an understanding about the organism, we need to have a scientific name. So therefore, scientists wanted to avoid this situation and to name them using a common name. So to do that, they came up with the scientific nomenclature. Nomenclature. And the scientific nomenclature was actually introduced by father of nomenclature, you all know him, nomenclature. He is the scientist who proposed the first scientific classification also. Who is that? Carolus Linnaeus. Carolus Linnaeus. So he is the scientist who actually proposed the First, scientific classification. He is the one who divided the organisms, the classification as natural classification and artificial classification and also proposed the different taxonomical levels. You all can remember that. Domain, kingdom, phylum, like that, the order. So, in addition to that, he is the person who proposed the scientific nomenclature. And this nomenclature is known as binomial nomenclature, binomial nomenclature. So you have to remember students, scientists needed a scientific nomenclature, a systematic method of naming organisms and father of nomenclature that is Carolus Linnaeus, he was the one who proposed this particular nomenclature and that is called binomial nomenclature. Bi means two, nomial means name, so each species has two names. Based on that, the nomenclature is given. So now we will try to understand that binomial nomenclature. So I told you all bi means two, nomial is name. So each organism needs to have two names. A successful nomenclature was introduced by a Swedish natural scientist called Carolus Linnaeus in 1753. So that was a long time back, Carolus Linnaeus. So that is why we call him the father of nomenclature. And each name, as it contains two epithets. So I told you all each name of each species contains two words or two names and those are known as epithets. So let's say Homo sapiens, we have looked at the name for modern man. Homo is one name, sapiens is another name. So both of them are known as epithets. Homo is the first epithet, Sapiens is the second epithet. So two epithets for an organism. It is known as binomial nomenclature because it has two epithets. We call it as binomial nomenclature. And this actually is in line with or the methodology to name an organism is regulated by ICBN. That is International Commission 
International Commission on Botanical Names, ICBN, and also International Commission on Zoological Name, Nomenclature. So that is ICZN, International Commission on Botanical Nomenclature and International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature. Those are the two organizations that regulate the nomenclature of organisms. Why do they need to regulate it? Even now, we tend to identify new species. So, scientists come up with new names. They have to make sure the names are in line with all the standards and also they are not similar to another name that is already there. So, because of that, the naming process has to be regulated. So that is what you need to know as the introduction for a binomial nomenclature. With that students, I will move on to the next slide. The standards of binomial nomenclature. Before I read the standards, I will explain it with an example students. So you all know the name of man, wise man. Homo sapiens. We have seen that example in under extra knowledge when the when we discuss the hierarchy of taxonomical levels. So when we write Homo sapiens, now when we say Homo, that is the generic name. Now you all know the hierarchical order: domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, genus species. So, genus is homo. We call that name as generic name. Then we write the species name sapiens. Sapiens. So, homo is the genus, sapiens is the species. So, this is known as the generic name. This is known as the specific name. But here, these two parts of the scientific name are known as epithets. So, homo is the first epithet, that is the generic epithet. Generic epithet. Then we have sapiens, that is the specific epithet. So, you can see a scientific name of a species has two epithets. First one is generic epithet, second one is specific epithet. And the first letter of the generic epithet has to be capital. Homo, H has to be capital. And the rest of the letters, the rest of the letters in the generic epithet and the specific epithet, they have to be all simple letters. Now, if we read this Homo sapiens, it's not in English. It's either Greek or Latin. So, these words are Greek or Latin words. But when we write, we use English letters to write it. The Greek or Latin name is written in English or else it can be written in Roman. That's how we write the scientific name. Then there is one more. When we write it, when it is handwritten, we need to underline it. The generic epithet has to be underlined and the specific epithet has to be underlined. And they have to be underlined separately. You all have to remember that student. So those are the standards. When handwritten, we have to underline. But when it is printed like here, it has to be italicized. The letters have to be italic letters. The you all know the slant italicized letters. That's how they are printed. Those are the standards. Now I'll go back. The standards of binomial nomenclature. The first one, the scientific name of a species or species name. Both refer to the same thing. So Homo sapiens is the scientific name of man or the species Homo sapiens, sapien species, is composed of two epithets. That's very important. We call them epithets. The first epithet is generic name and the second epithet is specific name. 
So, genus and species are included in the binomial nomenclature. That's the reason we call it binomial nomenclature. Two names. Generic name and the specific name form the two epithets. Then if we look at the third one, the species name is given in Latin or Greek. So the name is in either Latin or Greek. But when we write the scientific name, the scientific name of the species is written in English or Roman. That's important. So the name is in either Greek or Latin, but we write it in English or Roman. Is that clear to you all students? So then, if we look at the other two standards, the first letter of the generic epithet is capital and the other letters are simple. That is also important. The first letter of generic epithet is capital and the other letters are all simple. The last one, when handwritten, it should be underlined. And when printed, it should be italicized. So as an example, I have another example given here, Mangifera indica. Mangifera indica means mango. From here, from the name, you can get some information, students. So Mangifera, from the name, that's somewhat similar to mango. So you all can understand that it refers to mango. And when we say indica, it's actually endogenous to India. Indica. If we say Zelenica, it's endogenous to Sri Lanka. So like that, we can get some information from this scientific name. So here you can see, since it's printed, it's italicized. The same thing if we write it, then we will have to underline like this. Like Homo sapiens, we have to underline it. So when you're given a standard name, or a scientific name or a binomial nomenclature, you should be able to identify whether it has been written according to standard or not. So we can't write it like this. Homo sapiens, this is incorrect. Why? Because everything is capital. So that cannot be done. Incorrect. If we write it like that, Homo sapiens. That is also incorrect. Why? The first letter of the generic epithet has not been written in capital letters. Then the other one, if we let's say write it like this, Homo sapiens, that is also incorrect. Here this is capital. Here this is not capital. Here everything is capital. So all these are incorrect because they don't follow the standard. And in all these, once you write the correct spelling, once you write the two epithets correctly, first letter of the generic epithet capital, the rest of the letter simple. If it is handwritten, they have to be underlined. And underlining also, we can't do it this way. Now, if you write everything correctly, sapiens, if you underline it this way also, it's incorrect because here you can see it's a continuous line. That's also incorrect. So you have to remember all these standards, students. The standards of writing the binomial nomenclature. So again, if I read it so that you will remember it well, the standards of binomial nomenclature, the scientific name of a species or species name is composed of two epithets. The first epithet is generic name and the second epithet is the specific epithet. The species name is given in Latin or Greek. The scientific name of the species is written in English or Roman. The first letter of generic epithet is capital and the other letters are simple. When handwritten, it should be underlined and when printed, it should be italicized. So those are the standards. With that, I will move on to the next slide where we will look at some examples of scientific names, that is binomial nomenclature. 
This is an extra knowledge slide. For extra knowledge, few important scientific names are given to you. Man, Homo sapiens. So we already know that we are the wise man. So Homo sapiens means wise man, man who can think. Homo sapiens. You can look at the method that has been followed. Everything is italicized. There is a space between Homo and sapiens. And you can see the first letter of the generic epithet is capital. And the rest of the letters are all simple. And Homo is the generic epithet. And sapiens is the specific epithet. So that is the name of the species man. Then if we look at the next one, Asian elephant. Elephas maximus. So again the rules are, the standards are followed. First letter of generic epithet is capital, rest are simple, there is a space, it's all italicized. And from the generic epithet Eliphas, so you can see the relationship, it refers to an elephant. And Maximus, normally Maximus large, because it's a huge animal. So you can get some information. Then jungle fowl, Gallus Lafayette, that is the jungle fowl, national bird of Sri Lanka, Gallus Lafayette. Then we have Ashokapetia, Ashokapetia is a fish. This was actually identified by a person named Ashoka. To honor that scientist, they have included that name in the scientific name. And here you can see Puntius Ashoka. So that's the name of the person, Puntius Ashoka. Again, the standards are followed. Then we have Blue Lotus. That is again endemic to our country. Nymphia stellata. Blue Lotus. Nymphia stellata. But here students, you all have to remember, now we, although I say Nymphia, the way the word is spelled, because these are either Latin or Greek words. All these names are Latin or in Greek. So that is why the spellings are different. The way we pe the people pronounce it can vary a little bit from country to country or person to person. But when you write it, there can be no mistake. The spellings have to be correct and you have to follow the standard. Then we have the Na tree. Mesua Nagasaria. National tree of our country. Mesua Nagasaria. And we have coconut. Cocos Nucifera. Cocos Nucifera. That is the coconut tree. So these are a few examples of scientific names. I am sure you all can see that all the rules or all the standards are followed here. Binomial nomenclature, two epithets. First one is the generic epithet, second one is the specific epithet. You have to have the first letter of the generic epithet as a capital letter. The rest of the letters are simple. There should be a space between the two words, two epithets. And if it is handwritten, you have to underline it. If it is printed, it has to be italicized. And also the name of the species will be either in Latin or Greek. So those are the standards. You have to remember them. Although about the space, it has not been included in the standard. I told you all because you all have to remember students. When you write or when you look at it somewhere, when you type it, you have to make sure you write or type the two epithets separately. When we say binomial nomenclature, you can't have it as one word. So there has to be a space. So that is the reason I said there should be a space between the two epithets. So in the standard, when they say two epithets itself, they mean that there should be a space. I'm sure you all can understand that. So with that understanding, students, I will move on to the next slide. So then we have an assignment. Write scientific names of five animals and five plants with the help of newspapers, books and internet. So I'm sure students, you all learn these. You all read newspapers. You all look at books and you all go through the internet. So you can refer, you can look at the scientific name of any organism. And then you have to make a list. 
राइट साइंटिफिक नेम्स ऑफ फाइव एनिमल्स एंड फाइव प्लांट्स विद द हेल्प ऑफ न्यूज न्यूज पेपर्स बुक्स एंड इंटरनेट सो आई विल जस्ट शो यू ऑल टू एग्जाम्पल्स वन फ्रॉम अ प्लांट एंड वन फ्रॉम एन एनिमल बट वेन यू ऑल राइट यू ऑल कैन लुक एट ऑल दीज एंड राइट फाइव नेम्स इच सो एज अ प्लांट Now we discussed Mangifera indica. I told you all that is a mango plant that belongs to India or endemic to India. The same way we can have Mangifera zelenica. So you can re understand Mangifera means mango. Zelenica, it's in Sri Lanka, endemic to Sri Lanka. So there we can write it like this: Mangifera. Zelenica. Can I leave it like this? One thing, the spellings are important. Generic epithet, specific epithet. I have written the two epithets separately. First letter of the generic epithet capital. The rest of the letters are simple. What is the last thing I have to do? Since I have handwritten it, I have to underline it. Mangifera zelenica. So mango. Endemic to Sri Lanka. Like that, if you take a dog, the name of a scientific name of a dog is Canis lupus. Now we have discussed Elephas maximus, elephant. So likewise, you can write Canis lupus for dogs. So like this, students. I told you all. I will introduce two names. One is a plant. The other one is an animal. so like this you can write names of any species you can even remember microorganisms saccharomyces cerevisiae acetobacter acetai we have learned this before in your previous grades as well as you have come across those organisms when we were discussing the useful effects of fungus bacteria then you can remember so saccharomyces cerevisiae Saccharomyces. So this is again the scientific name of yeast. So you all can remember, students. Saccharomyces is the common term that we refer yeast with. So that is the generic name of yeast. Cerevisiae is the specific name of yeast. So here you can. Underline this because we are handwriting it. We need to underline, and this is a capital letter. The rest of the letters are simple. So, like this, you can even refer your former books. You can look at the textbooks, then you can look at the newspapers, books, and from the internet you can find any of these names. So, I am sure you will be very interested in finding these names and writing them down. So with that, students, I will move on to the next slide. Again, an activity: exhibit scientific names of few plants found in your school garden. So some of the schools have already done this. If you go go to the school garden, you can see a small name board giving the scientific name and information about the plant. Same in some of these botanical gardens. When you visit those gardens, they give you the name, the scientific name, information. Even they give you the family to which the plant belongs to. Sometimes the vernacular names. That is, the, those are the names used in that particular country. Those are also included. So, like that, you have to exhibit the scientific names of few plants found in your school garden. so i am sure you all can do that as a group activity that from that you will gain a lot of knowledge and it will be a very interesting activity but before you do that you have to make sure you find the correct scientific name even if it is a mango plant mango tree you should know what type of mango tree that is so you find the correct name the correct name of that species and then you can write labels so i am sure students now you all have a very good understanding about nomenclature not only nomenclature from the beginning of the lesson i have discussed what 
classification is we looked at natural and artificial classification under that we discussed the three domain classification and all the groups under that in detail thereafter i discussed the binomial nomenclature proposed by carolus linnaeus with you so now you are familiar with all the standards that you need to follow with that students i have come to the end of this lesson so i will move on to the summary of the lesson summary organisms are classified into groups to make it easier to study so that is one important reason why we classify organism easier to study all organisms are divided into three domains you all know the domains they are archaea bacteria and eukarya so you have to remember the names of the domain students three domain classification by carl woos prokaryotic organisms that live in extreme environments belong to domain archaea domain archaea includes methanogens and halophiles they are prokaryotic organisms why because their cell does not have a defined nucleus or an organized nucleus so they, those types of cells are known as prokaryotic cells and these are all prokaryotic organisms bacteria and cyanobacteria belong to domain bacteria you all know that two types of organisms then we have protista fungi plantae and animalia are the four kingdoms belong to domain eukarya under protista you all know protozoans and algae belong to that group fungi only fungus then plantae all the different types of plants and animals all the different types of animals then kingdom plantae is divided into two groups considering the fact that flowering and non flowering so flowering plants non flowering plants and they are further divided so the fact that flowering and non flowering similarly kingdom animalia is divided into two groups considering the fact that the presence or absence of vertebral column so if they have the vertebral column we call them vertebrates if they don't have the vertebral column we call them the invertebrates invertebrates evolve first and they are after the vertebrates invertebrates again can be divided into phyla so you have to remember this the taxonomic hierarchical levels phyla such as cnidaria analida mollusca mollusca this is incorrect students it has to be spelled as m o l l u s c a mollusca then we have arthropoda and echinodermata echinodermata is the other group then we have vertebrates are divided into groups like pisces amphibia reptilia aves and mammalia pisces hopisus is fishes then amphibia amphibians reptilia reptiles aves birds and mammalia all the mammals so we belong to mammalia living organisms are named scientifically using binomial nomenclature so you all know carolus linnaeus is the father of nomenclature he is the person who proposed binomial nomenclature and under that all the standards that need to be followed the species name includes two epithets that's why binomial nomenclature generic epithet and the specific epithet so that is what we have discussed in bit more detail in the lesson so after discussing the lesson now you all have a very good understanding about the types of classification and the three domain classification and all the groups under that we discuss them in somewhat detail so thereafter i discuss the binomial nomenclature with you so with that i will end this chapter and in the next chapter i will discuss the questions given in your textbook